Jesus taught his followers to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we really meant that, how different would our actions be? Are we blessing the earth or destroying it? Modern science and ancient Celtic Christianity both suggest a better way of being, exercising an ethic of stewardship, not dominion. On earth as it is in heaven, exploring our home, our faith, and what it means when they converge. Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew, where ancient Christian mystical practice meets modern interactive web technology, world-class jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. You've uh, made it to part four of our series on faith in the environment. Tonight's topic, uh, the harmony of God. We're looking at the fourth day of creation in the first chapter of Genesis for a cue and helping us explore that subject and what it means for us life in today's world uh, is Reverend Catherine Foote. Uh, Catherine is both a minister of a UCC, United Church of Christ Church in, uh, in Se Seattle, Washington, and she also raises sheep, and she drives a motorcycle to work. Very interesting person. Uh, we're really looking forward to, um, to our conversation with Catherine and her explorations into uh, not only the world of sheep herding and ministry, but also into the Celtic Christian world in Iona and throughout Ireland. So uh, she'll be letting us know a little bit more about uh, from her studies in Celtic Christianity. Also helping us on that subject is John Philip Newell, who will be uh, joining us via recorded video, the author of the, the Book of Creation, which many of you are reading uh, concurrently with this series. Well, your engagement with this series and this evening's topic will be uh, enhanced if you will consider also a question uh, that may be nagging you at the, the present moment. Uh, what's on your mind? If you could find spiritual insight about a question that's deeply central uh, to your life right now, uh, what would it be? Uh, we invite you to identify that question and hold it close. Uh, their insight may be on its way this evening. But before we go any further, let's take a look at what's happened so far in our series. We don't have to take Genesis 1 as some scientific account of how things happened, but rather uh, Genesis 1 is you know, part of that deep intuitive structure of our faith tradition, which is really talking about how God self-discloses God's very self as, as love. If, if God is in all of creation, which I, I believe that God is in all of creation, then how we treat creation says something about our relationship with God. With bounds, uh, if the damage is not too severe, the body will heal itself, a piece of ground will heal itself, the oceans will heal themselves, rivers will run clear. Mm -hmm. And that power of renewal in the wild world is a great source of hope, I believe. We keep forgetting, of course, that the ego is given to serve that center or that true depth within us, not to be, not to be the center. 
Poor communities, I do believe, bear the brunt of climate change in, 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 in many ways. Keen observations, self-awareness, and meditations brings us just a bit closer to the outer and inner cosmic illuminations. She knows how to fly like everyone, fly like we were meant to fly like everyone, fly like we were meant to fly like everyone, fly like we were meant to fly. to talking about the harmony of God by sharing a, an experience um, that I had in the high desert of New Mexico where we spend part of every summer. Uh, on this particular occasion, I had been in the high desert for some time of solitude and for, for some, some time of writing. And uh, at the end of my personal retreat, uh, I wanted to say a prayer of thanksgiving for my time. So I climbed up one of the high mesas um, and I was keen to say my prayer as the sun was setting because that is such a beautiful time in the high desert. And uh, you know the um, the great globe, the red from the great globe as it set was sort of pulsating across the high desert. Everything had a type of red glow about it. And all of my attention was on was on the sun, just about an inch off the western horizon. And as I stood offering my prayer, uh, a raven uh, flew just behind me, um, and was so close I could hear the swoosh of the wing. But she also she called out to me as well. So I turned around, and there was the full moon just an inch off the eastern horizon. Uh, this perfect equipoise between sun and moon that of course happens once a month on the night of the full moon. Um, but it's an equipoise or it's a harmony that we're often unaware of. We often live in such um, exile from, from the universe and from its rhythms that we live in a type of lack of awareness. So it was as if the raven was inviting me to, to wake up um, to, to a harmony that is there and to a harmony that, in a sense, the creatures now, in, in the Celtic Christian world, um, the creatures are often celebrated as having not forgotten. Um, it's we who have fallen out of touch with our senses, or it's we who have forgotten the interrelationship between all things and um, it's that it's that um, moving back into relationship uh, with one another as individuals but also as nations as religious traditions and moving back into relationship with the earth and with the creatures uh, this is seen as as the way of of wholeness this is seen as the way of salvation that what god has created as essentially one 
that essential interrelationship is still there. Um, we're not being called to manufacture it or to create it somehow. We're being uh, invited to very deeply and faithfully come back into relationship with it. The transitions of seasons are upon us, and that's part of that discussion that we're having this week is, you know, the times of the, the seasons and the days and the years and being in harmony with all that. Yeah, after yeah. a very cold winter, at least yeah. the second half of the winter, it's, it's hotter than heck right here in the, in the studio today. It's yeah, last week it was in the 30s, this week it's 80. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> it's supposed to be 50 again next week, so we'll see. But it's exactly that conversation that Leslie Morrill has spoken to in her blog this mm. week. She talks about living in the transition between the seasons and how we grumble about it all the time, no matter which season we're in, whether it's too hot or too cold or winter has gone on too long or whatever. And she says, so it's a matter of living in the season we're in, counting our blessings as they are not as they are, not as we hope they will be later. Acknowledging the diversity of each season of our lives and of our faith and all its beauty and living it now. Mm. So that. I think that's, you know, that harmony that J. Philip Newell is talking about is being able to, to be present in the present and be able to see the beauty in that now. Yeah. Well, we Nebraskans love to complain about the weather, and, and it, it's always changing. It's always an unusual, unusual for the season. This is unusual for the season, you know, but, but then I think about, you know, we, we complain about the, you know, the rain or the cold, and yet we also complain about being so busy, and yet the whole earth is trying to tell us during the wintertime, yeah. slow, slow down. down. During the rainy seasons, you'll go inside, relax, make a cup of tea, <laughs> just slow things down, and we, you know, we just, you know, because we're disconnected from that, we just complain about the weather and go about our busy lives. I think I'll remember that next winter and call in and say, I'm slowing down today. I, I won't be in. Be in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, th I think that might work. That's right. Uh, another thing that uh, I thought was interesting in the blogs this week, we had some s fabulous blogs yeah, again really did, yet yeah. this week. Uh, Cynthia Assel, Assel wrote her own poem as uh, she sits by the Prairie Creek uh, observing things and, and what a beautiful poem that is. So get online and, and read that as well. But Scott Fredrickson wrote about dandelions this week. Spring is in the air. Yeah. <laughs> and how um, it's not a question of whether you can love your neighbor or the dandelions and not call them weeds or whatever, but rather that you need to love them both. He says redemption is more about putting things in order, getting us to live in harmony with dandelions and our neighbors. It's not one or the other, it is both. Until the dandelion is loved, what chance does my neighbor have? <laughs> you know, in Germany, actually, they, um, they grow fields of dandelions, and uh, the cow's milk actually is heavily comes from eating dandelions. From eating dandelions. Well, they say it's fabulous, and I know up north uh, in, on the prairie where I used to live, it's the perfect plant for this, the sand. Mm. Um, the the most of the earth is sand there, and it's, it, it grows through that beautifully, and it helps nurture the ground. So why we decide to spend so much money to kill it, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. It makes a good point, though. If we can't, if we can't live with dandelions, how can we live with our neighbors? Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I never understood that anyway, because they come up easily. They take, almost, they take no care. They just grow. They're beautiful. There's lots of them. And like, yeah, we should be like crowning these things as like the yeah. ultimate flowers. At least that's my gardening style. I, don't, I just want to like <laughs> look at my yard and say, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I did that. I, I, it's my, my technique here. But <laughs> it looks really like a thing. random yeah. display of flowers. But really, I yeah. picked each spot where yeah, those right. dandelions are supposed exactly. to be. Plus, you can make wine out of it. So, I mean, there we go. What else? All the better. Yeah. It's all good stuff. Yeah, and salad. Yeah. Our, and salad. Yeah, they do. Right. Uh, f mission for One Earth yeah. this week. We big, big steps forward this week. Yeah. We have lots of good stuff. For those of you who may not be familiar with For One Earth, if you're just joining us for the first time, that's the National United Church of Christ. They yeah. are hap just happen to be uh, launching a major campaign to help uh, protect the Earth uh, and the environment. Uh, at the same time, we were doing the series, so we thought let's let's help them out here. They've got some big, lofty goals, and Darkwood Brew right. viewers are helping them to achieve that. So every week we're keeping track of some of the hours that folks are, are using to help think about the care of the earth. Uh, the goal for the UCC during these 50 days of Easter is a million hours of earth care, and we're at 91,349. That's a major Ooh. uptick from last yeah, week. I was getting worried uptick. a little last week, but it looks like uh, mm -hmm. people are starting to turn in their... Uh, 
they're ours. And goal number two is 100,000 trees. They're at 15,902. So right. we're getting really good gr growth there. Uh, goal, that was kind of a pun, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Next time we should shoot for dandelions, planting dandelions. Dandelions, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that way they will come up. Uh, goal number three, 100,000 advocacy letters are at 14,510. Mm -hmm. That too is a, is a huge jump. So keep those letters going, keep planting those trees, and keep getting on and recording your Care Earth hours. Watching Darkwood Brew is one hour already. That's right, yeah. And you get on the rebroadcast, and then there's two hours. So. There you go. <laughs> go to ucc.org and uh, uh, slash earth, and you can log in those hours there, and also see uh, videos from Darkwood Brew and those around the country who are engaging in earth care in one form or another. Exactly. Cool. Well, we also appreciate it um, when Darkwood Brew viewers uh, get on our site and hit the donate button, too. Uh, we really appreciate uh, this last week we had another couple donations come in. We are uh, we're almost about 19000 in our $25,000 matching uh, grant now. So um, thank you so much for uh, your help. It keeps Darkwood Brew uh, on the Internet and in community mm -hmm. uh, with you. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, up next, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Catherine Foote. So stay with us. She's fun. Catherine, it's good to have you uh, on the program at long last. We've been looking for an excuse to get you on, and this is the perfect night for it. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> so uh, for those of you, uh, well, most of you won't be aware of any um, connection between Catherine and myself, but she's actually got a connection between Catherine, myself, Chris Alexander, and our producer, uh, Scott Grissel. Do you want to tell, uh, uh, tell our viewership what our connection is, Catherine? Uh, I, I'll leave that to you because I think there are a variety of connections. Well, that's true. It fits, <laughs> that's it true. fits your theme. There's an inner, there's a web here, and so I'm just curious which strand you're referring to. That's true. You know, now I can think of it. We could take the next 10 minutes outlining our connections. But one of those fun ones is that uh, in 2006, some of us went on a little walk across the country uh, from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. to raise a voice for more progressive Christian faith and values, and Catherine decided, you know, we need to connect the West Coast to uh, this walk. And so she and a team from uh, University Congregational Church rode their bicycles from Seattle to uh, Phoenix, Arizona to connect the, West, the left coast to it. So that was great fun. That was, that was a great that was a great connection, and uh, and then I I actually flew out to Washington D.C. and uh, was with you on that very last day, and yeah. that was incredible. Yeah, yeah, that was a great time. Well, now you uh, just uh, not that long ago took a uh, sabbat. Well, first of all, you are a minister at University Congregational Church. That's correct. Is that right? Yeah. Right in Seattle. And you have rather a unique leadership model at your church. I understand. There are three pastors there, and we lead as a team along with our church administrators. So we have a four-person team, and we work uh, to lead in that way. Kind of a, uh, what we say is we're in community to lead a community of Christians. So it's, we're trying to do what we're asking our community to do as well. Mm, leadership through collaboration. Right. It's another one of those uh, interesting connections or webs. Uh, I think uh, J. Philip Newell was saying it so beautifully at the top of this show, that sense that we are all connected, how easy it is to lose track of that, how important it is to put yourself in, into places where you can be reminded of that. Yes, yes. And in the last couple of years, you put yourself into a significant place to be reminded of those connections by actually going to the community that he helped, uh, has helped in the past uh, lead in Iona, Scotland. Right. I, uh, I went to Iona uh, actually about six years ago, and I'm preparing to go again uh, this summer. I've also spent time in Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, 
uh, traveling on my last sabbatical and exploring the, wor the world of uh, shepherd, sheep, and sheepdogs. So for two months, I traveled through the British Isles watching uh, good dogs bring sheep off a hill. Uh, and uh, it, w it was phenomenal. Wow. So now, now why would a self-respecting minister like you uh, go and study sheepdogs in, in Europe? <laughs> Uh, it's it's part of that again, um, putting our self in intentional places to witness interconnection. So the the motto of the International Sheepdog Society is no good flock without a good shepherd, no good shepherd without a good dog. So there is something about that cooperation between shepherd, dog, and sheep that I. Think somehow has a deeper model for how we all are in creation, how we work together, how we team in different ways, how we trust one another, even across species, and figure out or learn or come to ways uh, to cooperate uh, for the good of the wider world. Hmm. That's what I wanted to immerse myself in. Hmm. Now, as someone who raises uh, sheep yourself, you're particularly sensitized to that already. Uh, so what, what are some of the things you, uh, you found, you learned, when you engaged in that kind of form of study? Well, like you said, I have a, I have a very small flock of sheep on Whidbey Island here uh, in the Puget Sound area. And I have to tell you, I was, I was up at 3.30 in the barn this morning because uh, one of my ewes was giving birth. She had, she had twin lambs. Uh, and they were both ewe lambs, uh, beautiful little girls, and uh, so I'm I'm operating on about three hours of sleep right now, as a shepherd does often this time of year. So there's there was also something that you were saying about seasons that I thought it's a fascinating season in the world of sheep, as lambs are coming in, or you might see lambs out in the pasture right now if they came in early, so or earlier. So uh, so I wanted to go to the British Isles and kind of get underneath that shepherd metaphor that uh, so permeates scripture. I mean, it's in, it's in the book of Psalms, it's in the book of Ezekiel, it's in the Gospel of John, uh, and uh, it's in First Peter, this, that symbol of shepherd and sheep and how we understand our relationship with our Creator our relationship with our world and our relationship with ourselves in some ways. So what if I go to the British Isles and immerse myself in that? Simply be present to it, not with a, a paper to write or an agenda, but simply witness it over and over again. Um, and that was, it was just stunning. Mm. So uh, as a result of that witnessing, uh, what did you find? Um, probably for me, the, the most important uh, moments in that time uh, were the moments when I really saw the connection and the trust between the dog and the handler. So uh, in a sheepdog trial, and I don't, Eric, have you seen sheepdog trials before? Maybe uh, you saw the baby, babe. Uh, <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just stole my joke. <laughs> uh, yes, that's the only trial I've actually ever seen. Of, so it was babe, yes. Wow, wow. Well, Bahram, you. There you go. Um, in, in the sheepdog trials in the British Isles, they will set the sheep uh, out 400 yards or sometimes even 800 yards and then send the dog for the sheep. Well, when you're working sheep 800 yards out, uh, you have to trust your dog. And the dog has to trust you. And there is something about that connection, that ability to trust one another, uh, so that when the dog, when you can no longer see the dog, you still know that the dog is doing the work it's intended to do. Or when the dog has, there's at one point in the trial, in the finals, uh, that, the, that the top dogs in the world are able to do, they've brought one flock of sheep in from an 800 yard outrun. And at, uh, they're about halfway in. In the meantime, the uh, folks have set another flock of sheep out another 800 yards in a different direction. And the handler has to tell the dog, look back. So at that point, the dog has to leave the sheep she has brought and look in a different direction, trusting 
what the handler says. After she's kind of poured her heart into the work that she's just done, she has to take that look back command and trust there are more sheep out there. Uh, even though you didn't see them, I can see them go for them. And and that moment, I mean, I watched it over and over again, uh, and it, it never ceased to be beautiful. Wow. I can just imagine just the amount of training that would take place uh, to build up that kind of trust relationship so that the dog, when the dog heard that command, just knew instinctually to, to go. All the, the kind of the... Um, the false starts, all, all the, the, the partial, and then not doing it, and, and, and what it must, just the ingraining of that, that kind of trusting relationship to know that, yes, when you hear the call, it's okay and it's right to go. Well, that's what's poignant about, about what you just said, Eric, and what I really like is because you talked about training, and then you talked about instinct, and then you talked about trust. So uh, there are some things you cannot train in a good sheepdog, but you can bring out in the relationship. You can, the trust is what brings out that actual confidence that the dog might have, that the dog can trust herself in some ways as she trusts you. So it is, it's a, it's a cooperation as much as anything. And that's the image I also love in ministry, in the work we're doing in the world, um, in our work as part of creation, where not the training or the mastering but the cooperation that lets the reality emerge or the gifts emerge, that's what I'm looking for. Mm. So where do you, how do you find this? It sounds like you've, you found an analogy there for the spiritual life and the way we live it. Uh, well, absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting that you talked about team ministry at the beginning because uh, I see that in my work with my colleagues at the church. Uh, I also see that in my congregation. I see it in my relationship both with God and and with uh, the wider creation that I'm a part of, that uh, it's not a mastery thing. It's a connection, trust, and emerging, unfolding uh, work that we're doing together. And as I think we I think we get off track when we begin to think, well, I'm the master, I know what to do. Uh, if you watch someone handle a sheepdog, uh, they call, they actually call them push-button dogs. Like, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do, and if you do exactly what I what I tell you, you'll do it right. Well, that they just won't have a good run. There's got to be that moment when the dog is thinking and the handler has stepped back and let the dog do what the dog was created to do. Uh, you know, in, in the same way that the dog can... It connect with the sheep differently than the handler will connect with the sheep. So, so all three of all three of the parties in that work are 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 doing the dance. Hmm. But if one party thinks they're in charge, that's when it's a train wreck. Yeah, that sounds like uh, almost the opposite of what you see in a lot of churches or even a lot of uh, uh, corporations too, where you have a manager who's going to micromanage everything and the whole structure is built actually on a lack of trust to all these checks and balances so that no committee you ever operates more than you know, two inches from the manager's you know nose in order to you know, to provide that oversight lest something go wrong or absolutely and take it into our relationship with the wider creation and you see some of that too you know you were talking about dandelions earlier well you know I don't want the dandelions here so I'll use this to wipe them out, but then I've got to deal with the consequences of what I just did by putting another layer on. Yeah, somewhere let's step back, take a deep breath like we did at the beginning of this um, broadcast, and reconnect, reestablish that, that balance uh, and unity that is, that is already there, and then cooperate with it. So you, part of your, your reasons for going over to Europe in the past have also been to kind of explore uh, the relationship between Celtic uh, Christianity and, and, and your Christian faith. Uh, are there any uh, heroes of the faith or particular insights you've learned from uh, studying those, uh, that, those, that ancient Celtic path? Well, I will say John Philip Newell is one of my heroes of the faith. I, I could listen to him talk forever. He's, he's amazing. Um, uh, I would also say uh, there is something about um, 
uh, that Celtic way that I think is reflected in some other traditions as well, that once again takes us back into uh, connection with the creation. So this idea that in the Gospel of John we hear the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And and in that moment uh, when Word becomes flesh, something important happens. Flesh or earth, the earthiness or something about that, that incarnation that is, is not uh, only a, a human incarnation, but a kind of a creation-wide incarnation matters, uh, matters deeply in the eternal reality, probably in ways beyond our knowing. And that's uh, one of the things that draws me in Celtic Christianity. Yeah. I like the way you pointed to that, 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 kind of the, that eternal reality that is already present here on earth. We're not waiting to, to die to participate in some eternal reality. It's actually um, uh, eternity is, is now in, in, as well as, as, as later. I'm frequently struck by the fact uh, that um, you know, the first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of Matthew and uh, Mark um, you know, are so frequently mistranslated in our tradition you know, that we, we're used to hearing um, you know, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, repent and believe the good news. But if you, if you open up the hood and look in, underneath and at the Greek, um, what he's saying is heaven is now. Uh, change your whole way of thinking. That is metanoia. Change your whole way of thinking and believe the good news. Believe that now is the time to connect, not simply uh, you know, later if you pass some test. I, I love it that you brought the synoptics right alongside John, you know, because the way John puts it is, uh, we, I... Jesus came to bring us life now, not in some future time, but right now. Yeah. And, and it's abundant and it's present. And the synoptics, you know, sometimes are seen as different than that. But, but boy, both of those messages come right alongside each other. Yeah. So, and I, I tend to go to the Gospel of John uh, for those words, but I, I love the way you brought the synoptics in, too. Yeah. Well, John is certainly good, good for that, and and also good for that notion that well, I'll just wait till Jesus returns, uh, you know, and and get raptured or something. It's like, um, be, well, besides just being a, a, a theology built on a lot of chewing gum and smoke and mirrors, um, that I mean, if you go look for the second coming of Christ in John's gospel, the second coming of Christ is the resurrection, and then he says, now I'll be, I'll be with you always in the form of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, that's the second coming has already come. Uh, it's already come. And when it comes, here's the other thing I love about John's gospel is the one who, ha who has Thomas uh, actually touching the wounds in Jesus' hands. And, and it is, whatever this means, it's, it's a, still a resurrection body, but the body still matters. In some ways, uh, what happened uh, on earth in flesh matters. It matters even after the transformation, even after the second coming, if, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and so John gives us that picture probably more graphically than any other gospel, uh, that whatever, whatever this life is, it includes all that we have been as well as what we are right now. Yeah. So if we were to push that out a bit, you know, that matter matters then, um, I'm just thinking about some of the news reports that have been coming out on NPR and elsewhere in the last a couple of weeks about the acidification of the oceans, for instance, and, and the way that the amount of carbon that we are putting up in the atmosphere is rapidly uh, uh, killing these major coral reefs, which are really the ocean's great uh, filters. And now, you know, in Nebraska, we're working out, you know, we're, we are discussing whether to allow a pipeline across Alaska that will bring um, more oil from Canada across the country so that oil can still be cheap. You know, in, in, in the world, um, if, our, if, we, if, if it leads to the acidification of the oceans and the killing of reefs, they've, they found that, that it's going to take hundreds of thousands, over 100,000 years just to restore them again. Are, are we edging on, on blasphemy, you know, if we, we kill, you know, huge parts of our oceans? Wow. Well, you know, blasphemy might be a word we would use. Another word we might use is uh, that kind of deep disconnection or deep brokenness uh, that uh, that we just close our eyes to. Uh, so I would say uh, if 
if at the heart of creation is a connection, a deep connection, that when we live as if there is no connection, um, there is a brokenness within us that echoes out into all of creation and and does tremendous damage. Mm -hmm. um, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's it's heartbreaking not simply for what happens out there, but it's also heartbreaking in terms of the fact that it is happening here. Uh, for me to assume that if I can't see it, or you know, I can put like put myself in a in a box and get my own climate just right, and then nothing else matters. Uh, I've missed the essence of what abundant life is all about. And I, and I think that's a Celtic teaching as well. Yeah. Uh, John yeah. Muir used to say it, and Muir, of course, was a great Scotsman before he came to this country. Uh, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Yeah. 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 Good point. And, uh, yeah, just to, to, to clarify, too, the blasphemy piece, I'm not talking about setting Christianity in this kind of crime and punishment idea, but really drawing from the Celtic idea. I think it's more about uh, you know, resistance you know, to the flow of, of God's will in, in creation versus uh, you know, going with that, letting ourselves into it. And when we resist, we create a problem not only for the earth, but ourselves, as you so helpfully point out. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Eric. I, that's uh, that's kind of ongoing. If it's kind of like if you if you step outside of uh, what you were created to be and how you were created to connect, it's not about punishment. It's simply about brokenness and how painful it is to live from that broken place, whether you know it right now or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's deeply painful. Yes. Well, if we're already uh, living a part of our eternal lives, we might we better uh, pay attention to our environment the, in which we're living it. Yeah. Well, Catherine, we're going to come back to you in a, in a few moments. We want to pause uh, now to attend to our central passage this evening, which is uh, from Genesis 1, uh, the fourth day of creation. Uh, that is, uh, if you have a Bible handy at home, that's uh, verses 14 through 19. And... If you're just joining us for the first time or, or, or fairly new to Dark or haven't been around for a couple of weeks, um, we have changed our format a bit. Um, we're actually really trying to engage in this ancient practice that's based on Lexio Divina in our Numa, we call it Numa Divina here, uh, because we, we're doing it with you over the internet and it's a little different. But um, we're going to, you're going to hear the passage read four times with a couple of minutes um, of pause between each reading. So this is going to take a little time, about eight minutes to be precise. Um, but during that eight minutes, um, it's going to be a very productive eight minutes if you will actually follow through on, on, on this, the guidance here. Um, it's, there's a reason why Christians have been practicing this ritual for over 1,500 uh, years, because it regularly jogs insights that are central to your own path in life that question that you identified at the front of the episode, we invite you to kind of hold that close. Or if you haven't um, found that, we invite you in the next 30 seconds as the band plays some music to simply take a couple breaths and consider what could you really use some help on if, if the spirit of the living God were to be whispering in your ear about something, what's important to you? What's so important that, that if you didn't find insight during this episode, you would be seeking it after, after uh, you know, tomorrow and the next day? Um, we're going to enter into a, a way of dealing with that question that may very well yield insights. We've been actually very happy with the responses that we've been receiving from our Darkwood Brew community that, wow, you know, this, this, this actually really works. So let's simply take uh, 30 seconds to center ourselves around that question, and then we'll hear our first reading. As you hear the first reading, simply pay attention to what the overall passage is saying. Just simply get a sense for the overall feel. Reflect on that for the next couple minutes. 
And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. about to hear the passage again, this time we invite you to simply listen for the word or the phrase that you feel drawn to. You may want to close your eyes after you identify that, or you can keep them open and see the, the passage continue to cycle. The key is, is to find the word or phrase you're drawn to, and then think of every way your life touches that word or phrase, every iteration you can find in your life. Open your mind wide and consider that word or phrase. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. This next reading, we invite you to simply take that phrase as we hear the, fa the passage once more. Take that word or that phrase and then hold it up next to that question that you brought. Uh, what is the connection or what are the connections between the word or phrase you were drawn to and the question you were drawn to? And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. 
and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. During this final reading, we invite you to, if you've, if you've found some sense of insight, then to simply consider uh, decisions to be made. And if no insight has come yet, uh, don't be worried. This is simply an exercise to help open us up, really, to a lengthier conversation. Continue to turn that word or phrase in your mind, circling around that question you've brought. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. We invite you to continue that uh, conversation uh, the rest of the evening, tomorrow. Uh, keep it going until you find something because uh, the chances are very high, actually, doing this kind of exercise. If you'll keep at it, uh, something uh, will come and come fairly shortly. If you do find some, something kind of crashes you over the head you don't mind sharing, uh, send me an email through the Darkwood Brew site or on Facebook. be happy to be in conversation. 
Well, let's uh, hand it over to the band for a few minutes. And um, as we do so, you might want to continue uh, pondering. And also, if you're on chat, we invite you to, we're inviting your comments tonight and your questions as well. Uh, for our Skype guest, Catherine Foote, and as well as in the coffee house. If you have questions, we invite you to write them on your, we have cards on your table, uh, write them and give them to Tracy, and uh, we'll be glad to address both comments and questions. Matt? Yeah, I'd like to take a minute to introduce the band quickly. On the keyboards, Mr. Matt Amandis on the drums, Carlos Figueroa, and Steve Gomez on the bass. And this feature is a Chuck Maroney composition entitled The Canticle.
Carlos Figaro and the hardest working hands in internet television. <laughs> Uh, nice we'll, hands. Yeah, that's right. Well, we want to bring uh, Catherine back, and uh, Chris has uh, been monitoring the chat on the internet, and that's been, uh, we've got uh, several responses, I think, on the internet. Yeah, we Incidentally, did. Incidentally, uh, our producer, Scott Grissell, just during the, that, that break also uh, came up and showed me on his iPhone, there's already, already been a message posted on Facebook, wow, love the new NUMA at Darkwood Brew. Yeah, it's getting lots of good raves, yeah. actually, so it's good. The discussion uh, during the new math is, was is really good. The, the chat room kind of goes quiet during that time, which, which is nice. Mm. But they do shout out some things here and there. Sun, moon, and stars, I gave them all to you, was the phrase that stuck out for some folks. And then Megan joined us and said that she was thinking about the greater and smaller lights in relation to a sermon that she heard. Um, Linda Jeremio? Yeah. <laughs> that, Jeremio? That was talked about little dark and big dark. So I'm thinking about what are the big and little lights and darks in my life and in the path ahead. Yeah, that was a great, great coincidence. Uh, uh, Linda actually is with the, uh, the Justice and Peace Ministry with the National United Church of Christ. She will actually be our final Skype guest for this series. So nice way to kind of tie <laughs> that together. But yeah, big dark nice. and little dark, interesting. You know, I've heard that uh, discussed in terms of, you know, a, a couple of different kinds of darkness. There's the darkness that means literally the absence of God, you know, associated with evil or, um, you know, that kind of that non-createdness. But then there's also the darkness that, um, that is said to be part of the natural order of creation, the shadow side of creation, which is really um, what we find in Genesis 1, that sense that, uh, you know, there's that, the dark side of ourselves, that, meaning not the negative side of ourselves, but the side of ourselves that is not directly accessible to us. Uh, as the, the poet David White has, has said before, who's also very influenced by the Celtic tradition, is you know, he says, you know, half of yourself, you realize that half of you is completely unknown to you. you know, literally half of ourselves, you know, roughly, um, we have no direct access to. Uh, we can tease it out, you know, we can, you know, kind of be in that, those kind of uh, sunrise moments where just the, the, you know, that, that which was, is kind of deeper within us kind of becomes a bit known, but really there's a whole side of ourselves that takes time and, and we get at indirectly through intuition, through hunches, through those times when the soul just kind of seems to stand up within us and we ask, why did that, why was I feeling that way when I heard that or saw that? Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, do you have any comments on, on big dark or little dark? Uh, well, sure. I, I, one of the things uh, that you led us in just now was that sense of if we're willing to enter into the quietness, which is another way maybe of talking about some of that darkness, associations might come up that surprise us. Uh, so there is something about darkness and rest or ryth the rhythm of uh the light and then the dark that uh, that b does bring up uh, deep truth. Absolutely. Yeah. I love the gen genius of the Hebrews too, and that they you know they don't start the day when us Gentiles do. You know, we we think the start of the day starts when we wake up, when we become conscious of it. Is we have a totally anthropocentric view of when day starts, but in the Hebrew view, and it, it, which is reflected in Genesis one, uh, day actually starts with night. It was evening right. and it was morning day one. It was evening and it was morning day two. Um, in, in other words, by the time we get up in the morning, the day is already half over. And so rather than simply saying, hey, I'm up and what's my to-do list? Let's go charge, charge. Um, really, the, the deep wisdom, I think, there is to ask, well, what has God been up to already? What's the world been up to already? What's the flow of my life already uh, been up to while I was absent from it, my awareness of it? Maybe I ought to join in the efforts uh, rather than, and, and it's, life is more about receiving and then joining into a flow rather than simply doing and being and constructing. Yeah, I, and I love that image of joining into the flow uh, because there, there is something about uh, noticing the shadow as well as noticing the light. It, yeah. matter, it matters. Yeah, that's right. Tracy has a, a comment or a question from the Internet. I we do, yes. Uh, this is actually a question for Catherine, and it's, uh, how does trust play into the relationship between the shepherd, sheep, and dog? And then as a follow-up, how about with God? Uh, yeah, a excellent question, because uh, trust ultimately is 
what builds the relationship and what makes the relationship work. And you can spot very quickly when there isn't trust. Uh, even ironically between the dog and the sheep. I mean, uh, here's the handler 400 to 800 yards away and it's all up to the dog when the dog first meets the sheep. What's going to happen is that flock will either become a flock because of their confidence in a way in that dog's ability to move them or they will scatter. Hmm. And, uh, and so I think the other piece that sometimes we don't see is not only the trust I might be establishing with with someone this way, but also the trust threads that are being established in a way out of my sight, but then will come back and enrich my life. So, um, so trust is a is a significant piece of what it's all about. In fact, in some in some cases, it's the foundation, and it is the part I think we tend to cut ourselves off of from when we think it's our job to control creation instead of uh, connect with creation. It's, it's not to say everything out there is trustworthy. Mm. I mean, there are times my dog shouldn't trust me <laughs> and in fact makes a better choice when she doesn't because she sees something I don't see. So she has to trust herself too. And, and a well-connected um, border collie will kind of know when to look at you and say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, and I'm right here, and I'm going to do it this way. And then, you know, there are other times when you got to say to the dog, look, we're trying to do something bigger here than you understand, so go with me on this. Yeah. That feels like, like God, too. seems that, you know, when I think about that training process, not being a dog trainer, but uh, th there's got to be a whole series of little tiny trusts that, that are built, built up so that when there's the big trust, like go run 800 yards where, you know, way farther than you could possibly see and trust that there's going to be a flock of sheep there to herd, that that, 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 that level of huge trust has to be built on a whole string of tiny trusts and, and how in, in our own faith journey on this earth, if we're going to talk about trusting God or trusting the spirit or even just simply trusting those that deep intuitive voice within us how you know if we haven't had that conversation with ourselves with God for a long time then you know how are we going to trust the voice when we perceive it it really takes a lot of small steps a lot of small tr you know trusting steps to be build up a relationship so that when those bigger decisions come you actually trust you have enough history of trust to know you know what I think I could take a step into the unknown here. Uh, that's excellent, Eric. I, uh, sometimes we, we mistakenly speak of trust as a static thing instead of a fluid thing. And those moments of deep trust and also those little tiny moments of simply knowing that there, there is God when uh, in this small moment when I needed God. Yeah. I think we have time. Just while, while we're actually going a little over time, but that's very unusual at Darkwood Brew. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I always get a hard time. This is an important question. So <laughs> I just heard my voice in, in my ear. The little, little the, 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 uh, our tech person saying, "Right." We, we have one more question. Let's hand it to Chris. We have so much conversation going on. I'd like to be able to include all these questions. So. From uh, Will, our brokenness from a discussion with uh, disconnection with nature, how do we discover for ourselves a way to mend it like you have with your sheep? Catherine, that's directed at you. Well, actually, I didn't hear the question, except I think it said, how do we, how do we reconnect? How do we find our own reconnections? Yes, our brokenness from a dis disconnection with nature, how do we discover for ourselves a way to mend it like you have with your sheep? Uh, I think very gently and patiently uh, start by simply going outside and noticing and uh, receiving whatever is there. Uh, know, what, know what time of day it is. Know when the sun comes up or goes down where you are. Uh, know when the tide is coming in or the tide is going out. Just take, take a small step. It's kind of like what you were saying, Eric. It's a small step of trust or it's a small step of connection uh, and then let it grow. That, I, think, I think organic is the key word there. Mm, love that. Well, Catherine, it's been a, a 
distinct pleasure to have you on our, our program uh, this evening. You've given us certainly uh, a lot of food for thought. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, seeing you back again sometime at Darkwood Brew. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Eric. We're just going to let the band take it for a couple seconds, and we're going to invite you, if you'd care to join us. Uh, every week, the, our experience culminates with uh, the ritual of communion. And if you happen to have bread and, and wine or juice and crackers at home, we invite you to uh, join us in this meal to conclude our episode. guys. I was impressed by that, that image that Catherine offered about uh, the dog uh, you know, coming up to the, to the finish and then the master says, look back. And the idea that you, know, you may not even see the, the flock uh, that's back there, but go and, and find that. And you know, I think about the, that as an analogy for uh, God's relationship um, with us as well. Um, and this ritual of communion here, it seems that uh, the ritual that we celebrate here is, in a sense, uh, you know, God's uh, telling Jesus, uh, look back, look back, and there's more to come. There's more of my flock to, to bring in. You know, I'm going to go on a little bit of a limb here, and you can, you can dispute me theologically if you'd like to take it up on Facebook, but um, I have a hunch um, that has been built up on a series of just kind of my own trusting relationship uh, with God, that God's ultimate plan for all of us is that all of us come into community with God in the end, in eternity, and that God is not going to give up uh, you know, working with us until, you know, he's sending us back, hey, you know, look back, there's more, there's more, until all of us truly come into a fullness of community, but out of our free will, not out of force. You know, that's going to take a long time, I imagine far longer than this life um, itself. But when I think about uh, all of the pain and injustice and the hardship uh, of life that we go through, I also wonder if perhaps you know, we go through this uh, because God isn't going to force us into community, that really God has eternity with us and God is going to keep going back for more, keep uh, that, that connection open, and that God is not willing to, to do anything to close down that relationship until we are all here and that perhaps one day we'll look back, you know, a long time from now and say, you know what, it was worth going through all this pain and hardship and so forth because we all made it into the fold. That the, the suffering that we go through um, is, a, is about God's will to save and bring into community all of us. You know, to me, uh, that is part of the redemptive purpose of this meal in which we remember Jesus on a night of betrayal and desertion taking bread and breaking it and saying, my friends, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, we took the cup saying, my friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we also know that if this is a sign of the deepest heart of the heart of God, then we are not alone in our suffering. That God has chosen to suffer with us until all find a home in God's love and grace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
I invite you to partake of the feast, the bread of life, the cup of blessing. Lord, my soul. Well, we thank you for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful uh, time of community and insight uh, this evening, and uh, we look forward to also uh, to next week when we will be joined by another author on Celtic Christianity who has been uh, actually a, a guest uh, oh, a number of months ago, uh, Bruce Epperly, uh, who was taught at uh, theology at uh, Lancaster Theological Seminary, and I think he'll be coming to us from Cape Cod. He's uh, written... Um, a book called "It's uh, The Center Is Everywhere. Also, we want to uh, take, do a, take a nod to our new social media and marketing guru who is in, in, uh, visiting us tonight from Iowa. You know him as Iowa Will. We know him as Will Rainey. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the Darkwood Blue Forum. If you want to know a little bit more about Will, you can read uh, my blog from, uh, uh, from a week ago. We, we posted a little bit of background on, on, on Will. All my friends, until next week, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong companion, and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone, and you are loved. Love beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen. Amen.